Hey everybody, it's been a tough list, but I wanted to show you my top 20 uh, solitaire games. I've done the top 100, and man, it took some effort, but um, if you want to see the full list from 100 down to 1, go and check out boxofdelights.net. Okay, so I'm going to run you through 20 down to number 1 today. It's been real tough finding that list of 100 games. I play a lot of solitaire games, as you know, and a lot of my subscribers like to watch solitaire games, they're looking for solitaire variants. So some of the games on my list have solitaire games out of the box. Some of them are multiplayer games with a solitaire variant. Um, some of them are even you know, home-brewed solo rules. And indeed, you'll find some stuff missing from this list because since I've put this list together, there's a few candidates for next year. Liberty of Death uh, from GMT Games in the coin series. We've got Pax Furiana and Pax Premier. Yes, I'm working on a solo variant for Pax Premier. I'm sure a lot of you have been anticipating uh, from Stonemaier Games, the Scythe game that's coming with its automaton. So I'm really looking forward to Scythe. I think that's probably my number number one for upcoming solo games. So let's kick you off then with number 20 and see if you agree with this list. You're not going to agree with all my choices. My choices have evolved over the last five years since um, starting Box of Delights. Um, maybe I've moved a little bit away from you know, your dungeon crawler, uh, purely thematic games more towards some a little bit of war gaming and some euro gaming as well so have a look at my top 20 see what you think at number 20 is hostage negotiator from van rider games i must applaud van rider games for taking on this game designing and trying to kickstart a game that only plays one player was always going to be risky the solitaire game market is much bigger i think than many people realize these days and reaching out to this market by kickstarter was a gamble that ultimately paid off for AJ Porfirio. It had to be a decent game to do that. The game approaches the theme sensitively enough, delivers a lot of tension throughout, balancing well the need to keep the hostage taker calm whilst trying to successfully extract hostages. This is done via a neat mechanism that borrows from the deck building mechanic, one I like to call hand building. Instead of managing a developing deck, each round you buy new cards for your hand to be used in the next round. The currency of the game is conversation points, earned by rolling successes with your dice in response to effects delivered by cards played from your hands. These cards represent your negotiator skills as you try to maintain an ongoing conversation with the hostage taker to free hostages, to calm the situation and earn more conversation points. This constant recycling of your cards and trying to keep the conversation alive, having to spend cards to earn more, is what gives this game its spark of design brilliance. An originality that so well reflects the theme. Hostage Negotiator gives many of us soloists what we want in a solo game. Simple rules, challenging play, good components, quick setup, small footprint, zero downtime and a unique theme with a good story. That's a lot to pack into a small box and few pull it off so well as my number 20 Hostage Negotiator. Uh, number 19 is by us Megafauna. What a superb game and what a superb theme. Phil Eklund has his own very recognisable style and he delivers games that you can tell are a work of passion. He admits he's more of a game designer than a game player, but he has a ready critic in his game playing son, Mark, who, in playtesting, seems to ensure his father's designs are very playable and not overly self-indulgent. It's this passion for game design that comes across and allows the soloist to really appreciate the work that's gone into Eklund Games. Megafauna, with its dinosaurs versus mammals theme, is a real treat for the armchair scientist and gamer. The joy is in watching your species develop and in watching a game system model millennia as ice sheets shift north and south, taking many biomes and species with it. This game was so close to being top 10, but the solo variant is just not quite there. It works. I devour the solo game and I relish its play, but the AI just misses the mark. So the good news is there are living rules, and you can get those from the Sierra Madre website, and we have a community of players who are contributing to make those rules better all the time. At number 18, Zulu's on the Ramparts. Another States of Siege title from Victory Point Games. You're going to see a lot of those on my top 100. If you like one game in the series, there's a good chance you'll all of them will give you something that, that, that will be entertaining. 
This time we're defending the famous mission station at Rourke's Drift, the siege of the Zulu tribes. There are other states of siege games on this list, but perhaps only one other communicates a sense of things so well. More on that to come. But the relentless onslaught of the Zulus echoes the desperation of the situation. You can feel the tentativeness of the Ubuntu as they slowly emerge over the horizon and their tenacity as they rally to rush your walls before retreating back to cover. Gallantry will be rewarded and heroes will be made. Win or lose, you will feel you have achieved greatness. At 17, Field Commander Rommel from Dan Viersen. The Field Commander series gives the board gamer a little taste of the war game genre. It's more strategy game than war game despite the theme, because mechanically it falls closer to the resource management and positional play of Euro games than to the detailed tactics and unit simulation of your typical war game. There's no hexes, there's no charts. It's rules light and plays relatively quickly, which makes it a wonderful first dip into the war game genre, especially for non-war gamers like me. I struggle with things like individual unit stats and abilities or trying to move tens of chits around a large map, but Rommel doesn't ask that of me. His simplicity will deter many war gamers, I'm sure, but this is why I think it shouldn't sit in the same pile of games. Instead, the game gives me the strategic kind of chess match that pits an operational commander against an abstract enemy. And this enemy can be relentless in its brutality. The game system is a little unforgiving. One little slip up and you'll never recover. This is the game that benefits from repeated play and strategic analysis. These are the game's strengths and what makes it enjoyable to play. After every battle, you'll be wondering where you went wrong and thinking about what you will do differently next time. At number 16, Eldritch Horror from Fantasy Flight Games. Fantasy Flight deliver great games with great components and great themes. Eldritch Horror is set in the same Lovecraftian world we see in Elder Sign, for example, or another game on my list. This time, it's a thematic card-driven game that has players exploring the globe, going on adventures, solving mysteries. I'm going to start by answering the question that's most often asked of me. Which do you choose? Eldritch Horror? Arkham Horror? Arkham Horror wins. It's not appeared on my list yet, um, but it might do. <laughs> I'll give you reason when we visit Arkham Horror. Yeah, I've spoiled the surprise. Arkham Horror is going to come up. But know that Eldritch Horror to me is a very different game. They have almost identical looking components and the themes are identical. But Eldritch Horror works on a different scale and puts very different demands on the players. It tells a good story. It's driven by a series of short-term goals. These are generally uh, pick-up-and-deliver type, uh, type quests. And has you managing actions very tightly. Much more like the Witcher adventure game. You've seen that one. Whereas Arkham Horror is more event-driven with a single long-term goal that can be met in a number of different ways. You've got to figure them out. What I enjoy about Eldritch Horror is the way it distracts you from the mysteries and its side quests. Remember these short-term goals. Um, so these little mysteries and side quests will distract you from those, particularly as you start to explore the expansions. I must confess, though, that the side quests can become very incidental with a low player count. Uh, you really must spend most of your time, all of your time, concentrating on the main storyline and completing those mysteries. So as far as comparing Eldritch Horror and Arkham Horror... I said don't bother. Eldritch Horror is closer to other games on this list than it is to Arkham Horror, like, like the Witcher game for example. Eldritch Horror plays relatively quickly though, it's very approachable with its concise rules, has lots of exciting ways to explore the game and is arguably the best way to explore the Lovecraftian world. <laughs>